Welcome to the Enchanted Library, where we turn the pages of books, beautiful and old, living and magical. It's time to curl up, get cozy, and join us on an adventure. Hello, friends. Today, we're reading from 50 Famous Stories Retold by James Baldwin. Julius Caesar Nearly 2,000 years ago, there lived in Rome a man whose name was Julius Caesar. He was the greatest of all the Romans. Why was he so great? He was a brave warrior and had conquered many countries for Rome. He was wise in planning and in doing. He knew how to make men both love and fear him. At last, he made himself the ruler of Rome. Some said that he wished to become its king, but the Romans at that time did not believe in kings. Once, when Caesar was passing through a little country village, all the men, women, and children of the place came out to see him. There were not more than fifty of them altogether, and they were led by their mayor, who told each one what to do. These simple people stood by the roadside and watched Caesar pass. The mayor looked very proud and happy, for was he not ruler of this village? He felt that he was almost as great a man as Caesar himself. Some of the fine officers who were with Caesar laughed. They said, See how that fellow struts at the head of his little flock. Laugh as you will, said Caesar. He has reason to be proud. I would rather be the head man of a village than the second man in Rome. At another time, Caesar was crossing a narrow sea in a boat. Before he was halfway to the farther shore, a storm overtook him. The wind blew hard, the waves dashed high, the lightning flashed, and the thunder rolled. It seemed every minute as though the boat would sink. The captain was in a great fright. He had crossed the sea many times, but never in such a storm as this. He trembled with fear. He could not guide the boat. He fell down upon his knees. He moaned, "'All is lost! All is lost!' But Caesar was not afraid. He bade the man get up and take his oars again. "'Why should you be afraid?' he said. "'The boat will not be lost, for you have Caesar on board.'" The Sword of Democles There once was a king whose name was Dionysus. He was so unjust and cruel that he won for himself the name of Tyrant. He knew that almost everybody hated him, and so he was always in dread lest someone should take his life. But he was very rich, and he lived in a fine palace where there were many beautiful and costly things, and he was waited upon by a host of servants who were always ready to do his bidding— one day, a friend of his, whose name was Democles, said to him, "'How happy you must be! You have here everything any man could wish. "'Perhaps you would like to change places with me,' said the tyrant. "'No, not that, O king,' said Democles. "'But I think that, if I could only have your riches and your pleasures for one day, "'I should not want any greater happiness.' "'Very well,' said the tyrant. "'You shall have them.' And so, the next day, Democles was led into the palace, and all the servants were bidden to treat him as their master. He sat down at a table in the banquet hall, and rich foods were placed before him. Nothing was wanting that could give him pleasure. There were costly wines, and beautiful flowers, and rare perfumes, and delightful music. He rested himself among soft cushions, and felt he was the happiest man in all the world. Then he chanced to raise his eyes toward the ceiling— what was it that was dangling above him, with its point almost touching his head? It was a sharp sword, and it was hung by only a single horsehair. What if the hair should break? There was danger every moment that it would do so. The smile faded from the lips of Democles. His face became ashy pale. His hands trembled. He wanted no more food. He could drink no more wine. He took no more delight in the music. He longed to be out of the palace and away. He cared not where. "'What is the matter?' said the tyrant. "'That sword! That sword!' cried Democles. He was so badly frightened that he dared not move. "'Yes,' said Dionysus. "'I know there is a sword above your head, and that it may fall at any moment. But why should that trouble you? I have a sword over my head all the time. I am every moment in dread lest something may cause me to lose my life.' 
Let me go, said Democles. I now see I was mistaken, and that the rich and powerful are not so happy as they seem. Let me go back to my old home in the poor little cottage among the mountains. And so long as he lived, he never again wanted to be rich or to change places, even for a moment, with the king. Damon and Pythias A young man whose name was Pythias had done something which the tyrant Dionysus did not like. For this offense he was dragged to prison, and a day was set when he should be put to death. His home was far away, and he wanted very much to see his father and mother and friends before he died. "'Only give me leave to go home and say good-bye to those whom I love,' he said. "'Then I will come back and give up my life.' The tyrant laughed at him. "'How can I know that you will keep your promise?' he said. "'You only want to cheat me and save yourself.' Then a young man, whose name was Damon, spoke and said, "'O king, put me in prison in the place of my friend Pythias,' and let him go to his own country to put his affairs in order, and to bid his friends farewell. I know he will come back as he promised, for he is a man who has never broken his word. But if he is not here on the day which you have set, then I will die in his stead. The tyrant was surprised that anybody should make such an offer. He at last agreed to let Pythias go, and gave orders that the young man Damon should be shut up in prison. Time passed, and by and by the day drew near, which had been set for Pythias to die, and he had not come back. The tyrant ordered the jailer to keep close watch upon Damon, and not let him escape. But Damon did not try to escape. He still had faith in the truth and honor of his friend. He said, If Pythias does not come back in time, it will not be his fault. It will be because he is hindered against his will. At last the day came— and then the very hour. Damon was ready to die. His trust in his friend was as firm as ever, and he said he did not grieve at having to suffer for one whom he loved so much. Then the jailer came to lead him to his death, but at the same moment Pythias stood in the door. He had been delayed by storms and shipwreck, and he had feared he was too late. He greeted Damon kindly, then gave himself into the hands of the jailer. He was happy because he thought he had come in time, even though it was at the last moment. The tyrant was not so bad, but that he could see the good in others. He felt that men who loved and trusted each other, as did Damon and Pythias, ought not to suffer unjustly, and so he set them both free. I would give all my wealth to have one such friend, he said. A Laconic Answer Many miles beyond Rome there was a famous country which we call Greece. The people of Greece were not united like the Romans, but instead there were several states, each of which had its own rulers. Some of the people in the southern part of the country were called Spartans, and they were noted for their simple habits and their bravery. The name of their land was Laconia, and so they were sometimes called Lacons. One of the strange rules which the Spartans had was that they should speak briefly, and never use more words than were needed. And so, a short answer is often spoken of as being laconic, that is, as being such an answer as a lacon would be likely to give. There was in the northern part of Greece a land called Macedon, and this land was at one time ruled over by a warlike king named Philip. Philip of Macedon wanted to become the master of all Greece, so he raised a great army and made war upon the other states, until nearly all of them were forced to call him their king. Then he sent a letter to the Spartans in Laconia, and said, If I go down into your country, I will level your great city to the ground. In a few days an answer was brought back to him. When he opened the letter, he found only one word written there. That word was, If. It was as much as to say, we are not afraid of you so long as the little word if stands in your way. The Ungrateful Guest Among the soldiers of King Philip there was a poor man who had done some brave deeds. He had pleased the king in more ways than one, and so the king put a good deal of trust in him. One day the soldier was on board of a ship at sea when a great storm came up. The winds drove the ship upon the rocks, and it was wrecked. The soldier was cast half-drowned upon the shore, and he would have died there had it not been for the kind care of a farmer who lived close by. 
When the soldier was well enough to go home, he thanked the farmer for what he had done, and promised that he would repay him for his kindness. But he did not mean to keep his promise. He did not tell King Philip about the man who saved his life. He only said that there was a fine farm by the seashore, and he would like very much to have it for his own. Would the king give it to him? Who owns the farm now? asked Philip. Only a churlish farmer, who has never done anything for his country, said the soldier. Very well, then, said Philip. You have served me for a long time, and you shall have your wish. Go and take the farm for yourself. And so the soldier made haste to drive the farmer from his house and home. He took the farm for his own. The poor farmer was stung to the heart by such treatment. He went boldly to the king and told the whole story from beginning to end. King Philip was very angry when he learned that the man whom he had trusted had done so base a deed. He sent for the soldier in great haste, and when he had come he caused these words to be burned in his forehead, the ungrateful guest. Thus all the world was made to know of the mean act by which the soldier had tried to enrich himself, and from that day until he died all men shunned and hated him. Alexander and Bucephalus One day King Philip bought a fine horse called Bucephalus. He was a noble animal, and the king paid a very high price for him. But he was wild and savage, and no man could mount him or do anything at all with him. They tried to whip him, but that only made him worse. At last the king bade his servants take him away. "'It is a pity to ruin so fine a horse as that,' said Alexander, the king's young son. "'Those men do not know how to treat him.' "'Perhaps you can do better than they?' said his father scornfully. "'I know,' said Alexander, "'that if you would only give me leave to try, "'I could manage this horse better than anyone else.' "'And if you fail to do so, what then?' asked Philip. "'I will pay you the price of the horse,' said the lad. "'While everybody was laughing, Alexander ran up to Bucephalus "'and turned his head toward the sun. "'He had noticed the horse was afraid of his own shadow. "'He then spoke gently to the horse and patted him with his hand.' When he had quieted him a little, he made a quick spring and leaped upon the horse's back. Everybody expected to see the boy killed outright, but he kept his place and let the horse run as fast as he would. By and by, when Bucephalus had become tired, Alexander reined him in and rode back to the place where his father was standing. All the men who were there shouted when they saw that the boy had proved himself to be the master of the horse. He leaped to the ground, and his father ran and kissed him. "'My son,' said the king, "'Macedon is too small a place for you. "'You must seek a larger kingdom that will be worthy of you.' "'After that, Alexander and Bucephalus were the best of friends. "'They were said to be always together, "'for when one of them was seen, "'the other was sure not to be far away. "'But the horse would never allow anyone to mount him but his master. "'Alexander became the most famous king and warrior that was ever known, "'and for that reason he is always called Alexander the Great.' Bucephalus carried him through many countries and in many fierce battles, and more than once did he save his master's life. Diogenes, the Wise Man At Corinth, in Greece, there lived a very wise man whose name was Diogenes. Men came from all parts of the land to see him and hear him talk. But as wise as he was, he had some very queer ways. He did not believe that any man ought to have more things than he really needed and he said that no man needed much. And so he did not live in a house, but slept in a tub or barrel, which he rolled about from place to place. He spent his day sitting in the sun, and saying wise things to those who were around him. At noon one day, Diogenes was seen walking through the streets with a lighted lantern, and looking all around as if in search of something. "'Why do you carry a lantern when the sun is shining?' someone said. "'I am looking for an honest man,' answered Diogenes." When Alexander the Great went to Corinth, all the foremost men in the city came out to see him and to praise him, but Diogenes did not come, and he was the only man for whose opinions Alexander cared. And so, since the wise man would not come to see the king, the king went to see the wise man. He found Diogenes in an out-of-the-way place, lying on the ground by his tub. He was enjoying the heat and the light of the sun. When he saw the king and a great many people coming, he sat up and looked at Alexander. Alexander greeted him and said, 
Diogenes, I have heard a great deal about your wisdom. Is there anything I can do for you? Yes, said Diogenes, you can stand a little on one side, as to not to keep the sunshine from me. This answer was so different from what he expected that the king was much surprised. But it did not make him angry. It only made him admire the strange man all the more. When he turned to ride back, he said to his officers, Say what you will, if I were not Alexander, I would like to be Diogenes. Thank you for joining us today. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave a review on your favorite podcast platform and share our podcast with a friend. Visit our website at www.enchantedlibrary.net to see our past books or to connect with us on Facebook. If you'd like to support the work we do, you can visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash enchanted library. We appreciate your support. Until next time, friends, happy reading.